today's episode of Humor Talks, we've got Michael Whitaker, who serves as a supervisory special agent for the FBI's Office of Private Sector, which connects industry leaders with FBI professionals to address emerging threats facing organizations, including terrorism, cyber intrusion, espionage, and fraud. He is a former attorney receiving his doctor of law from Cleveland State University and fun fact, worked as a project employee for Kurt Court TV. So Mike, it's so great to have you with us. Drew, I'm so ecstatic to be here. I, I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, I, I hope you're ready to have an FBI agent on a humor podcast. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. When you read your resume, what you think is exactly like attorney to FBI agent, you're like humor all the way. Uh, but that's actually something that I really appreciated. Anytime we've chatted or things like that, I feel like we've had great conversations. And we'll definitely talk a little bit about the, the power of humor in just a moment. But first of all, I'm curious, and I'm sure many other listeners are curious, like, how does exactly does one end up at the FBI? It's quite a story, really, when I think about it. So I, uh, I finished college. I really wasn't sure where I was going to go. And I'm like, you know what? I kind of wanted to do law school. I did law school. And it was, uh, I enjoyed it, but I didn't have the passion. Then I came out in 2008, and the market was not very good. And I said, oh, my gosh, you know, I have a law degree. Let me try to be a FBI special agent. And so it's a Hold little on, bit of a wait, wait, so the, the thought process is it's hard to get a job as a lawyer right now. So let me just go FBI special agent instead. Not like, oh, I'm going to go and work down at like the local store or something like that. <laughs> You're like FBI agent all the way. Well, I, I always wanted to do it. I wanted to do something secret squirrel to give back. <laughs> and so I said, you know what? Let me apply. Because I didn't know a single person who is an FBI agent coming mm -hmm. from Cleveland, Ohio. I, I knew nobody who was in the FBI. So I said, let me start the application. What's the worst I can hear is no. Mm -hmm. And so I was an attorney. I, I was doing all sorts of crazy cases. I mean, the fact pattern, my, my stepfather actually had a small law firm at the time. And he's like, Mike, I'm going to give you a few cases to get your feet wet. And I had literally the underwear thief was one of my first cases. Like you can't make this up. And so I started to do those cases. I did a few court appointments. I learned a lot. And all of a sudden, I started to get further and further in the process. And then here it came. Mike, we have an opening at Quantico, January 31st, 2011. Are you in? And I said, wow. yes, let's do it. And all right, so a couple of questions about that, because I, I think there's one just for anyone listening. I think it's valuable. Like you start to you do something, right? You're doing some of these cases and deciding like, do I like this? Do I not like this? And, and so it's educating you to say, okay, this is something I do or don't like. And then what was that time period to go from, hey, I applied to then show up to, to Quantico? Was it relatively short or was it kind of like a process where you're like, I don't know. Do you remember kind of what that time frame was? It took about a year to a year and a half. I, I, I took a little bit longer just because I had just gotten a job with the judge. I was going to go down to Florida. I was going to take a bar there. Then all of a sudden, the process started getting more moving full, more forward and forward. And I'm like, I can't leave the judge after six months, even though this is a, what I exa exactly want to do. So they were able to give me a few months. And then I reported to Quantico. Wow. And, and so tell me a little bit about Quantico, I guess, of, of what you can, because my limited knowledge of it is kind of just what we see in media on TV shows and, and things like that. Is that an accurate depiction of kind of what we see out there? Is it super intense? Is it like fun and jovial? Is it like, what's the, what's it the actual experience? Like you show up there kind of that first day or that first week. Yeah, exactly like TV. Everyone's attractive, wearing provocative clothing. No, it's uh, it's definitely, it's a learning experience, but one I would never, I, I just would never give it up. I, I, I so, I enjoyed it. The first three weeks were definitely extremely, like they were difficult. Here is a guy who's never been in the military, who I was an attorney literally a week before, and now I'm in kind of a pseudo military law enforcement boot camp. But it did really give you a set of tools that you're just not going to get anywhere else. So, yeah. I mean, I can still remember the shorts, like the shorts were about two feet too high. And so you're like, hey, let me go to a, a large, maybe they will, you know, go a little lower. No, they're still two feet too high. It's like the waist gets bigger. 
Yeah, it's and, well. I mean, you gotta you gotta keep that fabric so it doesn't kind of get in the <laughs> in the way. And were you? Because like it's it's you've you've shared with me at least in the past like some of the the, the capabilities that you needed. Were you? working out beforehand like how does one prep for like the physical aspect of it because i would imagine it's not something that you can be like oh i haven't done any training whatsoever i'm just going to show up and immediately i can do the like under x minute mile and the you know number of push-ups and all that kind of stuff that you needed to do were you mit like physically preparing for this and in, in addition to the mental preparation i was there, there's something called the physical fitness test an examination so they have it's push-ups it's sit-ups it's a 300 meter sprint as well in a mile and a half run. So you really have to prep because if you're not prepping, you're not gonna pass. You only have five minutes in between. So it, it was strenuous. And we had people who were uh, like former Rangers, like a lot of other military folks. So they were in perfect shape. But if I can make it, I know a lot of other of your viewers, like you can do it. As long as you, you put the effort and the time in, you will pass. Yeah, right. It's like anything. Like any, you do that that preparation work. You do the yep. do the practice for it, and and so now that was that was a, a quite a few years ago. And now you're working specifically in the office of private sector, which is mm -hmm. kind of how you and I have connected in a way. But what is for the office for people that don't know? Because I had never heard of it. What is the office of private sector? So the office of private sector. I know most people. You think of FBI. You're thinking of those large takedowns, the arrests. Mm -hmm. But what people don't always understand is corporate America, academia, a lot of our infrastructure, they're, they're targets. They have the proprietary technology. And another fact is 85% of critical infrastructure is owned by the private sector. So if we mm -hmm. don't have these relationships, we're not gonna be very good at our job. So as a result, we'll do threat briefings. We'll share Intel with them as well. We have, there's two programs. It's called the Domestic Security Alliance Council mm -hmm. and InfoGuard. And so what we do is we have portals where we'll share liaison information reports. They can report tips. It's a lot easier to prevent a crime than to investigate after. So we always want mm -hmm. them to be aware of the threats out there, what we're seeing, because one of the beauty of the FBI is there may be a scheme out in California that maybe you haven't seen in Cleveland. So we can alert folks in, in Ohio, in North Carolina, wherever, about these threats that we're seeing. Okay, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, I, I remember first moving to New York and um, walking around and getting approached by someone with some kind of like, I can't remember, some elaborate story about needing a bus ticket to somewhere or whatever. And I was with a friend of mine who also like had been living in New York for a while. And like, don't worry, I see that guy here. He's here every single day. He gets in a car when he leaves. He's been needed, he's needed a bus ticket for seven years at this point or something like that. It's like, that's clearly not something that is, is real. So it's like one of those things of like, okay, if I learn it here, you can reapply it and, and share it there, which uh, makes, I think, a tremendous amount of sense. And so to jump into kind of some some exploration around humor, right? Because we're talking about this as a yeah. uh, the the humor conversation. You and I first got connected a few years ago. There's a, a an annual conference for uh, the Office of Private Sector, and you had reached out about you know, hey, can you come and speak and talk a little bit about humor? Do you remember what it was about either the talk or the topic? Like, why do you see humor as a valuable thing for the work that you all are doing in the Office of Private Sector? What I started to, to notice is to really make a presentation from good to great, uh, it's just that extra element. So we spent a lot of time looking through how do we make this two-day affair the best we can? Because I've been to a lot and some of them, when you're there for 48 hours for such a long time, it's easy to zone out. Like it really is. And even if the briefing is great, if you're not keeping people engaged, it's just going to suffer. So we had looked through a lot of TED Talk speakers, then all of a sudden we came across this guy called Andrew Tarvin, and we did, we had a, we had a huge, we love uh, just having white papers and just things like we really, what we do in the FBI is very strategic. Mm -hmm. And so what we wanted to do is have all these coordinators come, but also enjoy it as well. And so that's where we saw, let's put a little bit of humor in this. And, and I know, I still remember your fun fact. It was, what was it? I drank four milkshakes in one day. Mm -hmm. That's and right, then, yeah. Uh, yeah, a letter, a letter in bowling. So it, it opened the crowd up. 
when you have executive seventh floor folks starting to talk about these things and laugh, belly laughing, you know you've actually done something very effectively. Absolutely. And I, I remember the, first of all, it was certainly a very intimidating audience, at least for me to speak mm -hmm. to. And I think I even shared at the beginning of like, this is the first time I've ever spoken to the audience where like 90% of the room is armed. <laughs> and I think I think the correction was like, ah, it's probably about 98. I think you're the only one not armed uh, currently in this room. Um, but it's certainly intimidating. I know one of the things that we kind of had this conversation about is, especially for a group like the Office of Private Sector, mm -hmm. there's a certain connotation or or feeling that comes with like, if you see FBI on your caller ID, it's like, even though even when we're planning the event, it's like, I know this is a good thing, but I still, it feels like, I don't know, it's kind of like, even when you're doing nothing illegal, mm -hmm. just a cop car there is you're like, okay, I'm a little bit, like a little bit more on edge, perhaps a little bit. Yep. And humor allows you all in the, the work to bring a little bit more of a connection to help to kind of, you know, dispel some of that tension or maybe some of that status differential that exists because of their perceptions around it. I mean, is that part of what you're seeing kind of in the work of like, hey, if I can get this person laughing, we, we have a stronger relationship or a better connection? A hundred percent. Because... You're, when you're meeting with sources, informants, it's still, you are human beings. Mm -hmm. You want to work with someone who you like or have some type of connection. Because I can remember, as you start to do this more and more often, you start to see what works, what doesn't work. And I can remember you'd have a couple brand new agents and people like, man, I don't want to work with that guy. He's a little bit too stiff. But mm -hmm. it it is a learning process. I mean, you want folks to know tomorrow is going to come, that this is going to be all right. Because when people are extremely stressed out, you sometimes get tunnel vision. So it's really important that you create those bonds. You always want to work harder and better for someone that you like. What so, I, sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's interesting because it makes sense, but at the same time, you're like, oh, yeah, the same stuff that applies to when we're working with people at Microsoft, the same thing that applies if we're working to people at a like local mom and pop shop like this. It's mm -hmm. it's very much human nature type yep. stuff like same thing in the organization. This is why research, I think, shows that people who use human or humor are often given more opportunities, because if you exactly like you said, if there's two people and you're like, do I want to work with a person who's kind of good at this, but also about as entertaining to talk to as a brick wall? Mm -hmm. Or do I want to work with the person who also gets their work done, but I can have a good conversation with them? It's like, oh, you're going to go to the person that has probably a stronger sense of humor. And it sounds kind of like the same case here in this scenario. Definitely. I mean, there's also the whole operational side and then even internal side. Just today, we had a large conference call with a lot of our private sector coordinators and I always start off with just a little bit of humor. I usually like to make fun of the Browns. I'm a Cleveland fan, but now that we finally won a game in a playoff game and the coach didn't jump into Lake Erie after an 0-16 season, it just kind of lightens the mood before you get into the meat and substance of the meeting. Yeah, and that's what I was so as I grew up in Cincinnati, so I'm a Bengals fan. So the, the tides have turned, at least when I was growing up, the Browns were the like ones that we made fun of in the state. And now it's very much uh, the Bengals, uh, but it, it creates this accessibility. So that was good. Like, so it's a great segue into it. I'm curious, like, how would you characterize your sense of humor, maybe as, as a whole, and then also how that relates to the workplace? So... I'm more of a self-deprecating humor type person because I never like to, people to feel uncomfortable and a little bit, I will tease here and there what you start to realize with these high stressful situations, especially in a squad in the FBI, mm -hmm. it, I mean, there's stress. And, but I still remember when I first got there, if they're not giving you a hard time or teasing you a little bit, that means they don't like you. So this kind of gentle ribbing and people getting these, nicknames, stuff like that. That's kind of the bonds. That, that's what keeps mm -hmm. a squad unity together and it makes work more effective. Well, and, and that's something that we actually, we see a lot of in some of the other groups that we've worked with of emergency first responders, et cetera. Like mm -hmm. you said, it's, it's a way of bringing people closer together. And, and it's interesting because banter is such a, uh, an interesting type of humor because sometimes it can be seen as aggressive but a lot of times it's affiliative a lot of times like especially when we've done work with groups from australia or the uk mm -hmm. that kind of like 
us ribbing that playful ribbing a little bit of each other like you said is a way of saying like no i feel comfortable with you the fact that i can yep. you know kind of say this about you means that uh we're close or that we're connected and and i think that humor goes a long way and so would you say that that is the same type of humor that you use outside with your friends as well or do you adapt your style for the the workplace i i'm kind of a little bit of a chameleon i i we do have some pretty sensitive and some very, I mean, when you think about just what the FBI deals with, you do have to be cognizant of what we're talking about. You can't have humor all the time, but right. I do have some of those friends where you tease more self-deprecating. So I will kind of vary, but usually it's me kind of talking about funny stories or nicknames or just things that have happened to me in the past. That's kind of my usually MO. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm curious about that uh, around the, you know some of those stories and examples because it is a right, it's still very much a, a human thing, and we we touched upon this before we actually started hitting record it, and it was something that I never thought about. But it's like, yeah, what is something? What is like normal life stuff like when you're an FBI agent? Like, so what is like dating like huh. if you're an FBI agent? Like, how do you what do you even say when someone says what do you do? Can you tell them like what happens? Well. It's funny. My, my first met my wife, I was in uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, and I went out with a couple of their FBI agents. And of course, that subject always comes up. So I'm always waiting to see, oh, what's the other person going to say? So I had one buddy, he would say like a lion tamer and all this interesting stuff. And, and then I remember my wife had asked me, oh, what do you do? And at first, I used to say, a stunt double in Fast and the Furious. And she'd be like, oh, yeah, okay, okay. But then you started to realize if you put out a little bit of a fact, such as at one hour and 23 minutes, if you pause it, you'll see my smiling face. People are like, oh, really? Really? Maybe this guy is telling the truth. And then I'd be like, oh, actually, I'm an FBI agent. And so they're like, okay, now this guy is totally lying. And uh, yeah, I'm a Navy SEAL too. Yeah. So my wife really didn't believe me for a long time. She thought... And then finally, I, she like literally thought my credentials were maybe made in China. And then finally, she's like, I think he really is an FBI agent. All right. This, this lie is going on quite a bit. Maybe I'm actually going to believe him <laughs> at this point. I never thought of, like, yeah, like it's just a thing that, which I think humor can help us do is it can shine a light on this idea of like, oh yeah, I've never thought about that, what that process is like, or, mm -hmm. or how you have to go through um, entering this. I also like that the, you know, that it wasn't like, I'm just going to get, I'm, oh, I'm an accountant. Cause you'd get zero questions about that. It'd be like, oh, okay, all right. But you still wanna be like interesting, uh, I guess in that regard. So Lion Tamer, I feel like is pretty good. I like Stunt Double. That's a pretty accurate thing. A friend of mine, she would lie, I think just because she didn't like certain people hitting on her and she, her, yeah. her go-to lie was that she writes the funny messages on Taco Bell hot sauce packets. <laughs> she's hired yeah she's hired, right like that's so specific that you're like okay i guess i'm gonna believe whatever it, it is that you say and so you know whether it's it's there dealing with kind of like dating or other things do you see humor as part of kind of stress management because as you mentioned it's a it's a very serious kind of role i remember one of the things that stood out to me when looking at the agenda from the session it was me speaking in the morning about humor and then later in the afternoon there was just a session titled international kidnapping and it's like that that is a juxtaposition of hey we're going to talk about how humor and, and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff and then you're going to talk about something very serious and something very kind of like important um and also something that is inherently probably not very humorous but do you see humor as a way to manage that stress among the fbi agents a hundred percent i mean you have to sometimes laugh about this stuff. I mean, there has to be the correct time and place, but really, if you don't, it'll just boil up inside. I mean, that's why sometimes law enforcement does have a hard time with stress management because you are seeing some terrible things. Like how can human beings treat other human beings like this? So it is very important sometimes to step away, to get with close friends, to laugh, to watch some of your favorite movies. So I, I think 110%, I'll call some of my funny friends, I'll see what they've been up to. If I, if I always want comic relief, I'll call my friends from Cleveland, so. 
<laughs> exactly. Or, or watch the Cleveland tourism video from a few years ago. Oh my uh, gosh, you saw that? Yeah. Oh yeah. I think that made it. It made it to like a friend of mine, like from uh from somewhere in Europe. I can't remember where. Like reached out. Like, aren't you from Ohio? And I was like, no, but I'm from Cincinnati, the good city. <laughs> in Ohio and like, yeah, so a lot of people have seen that, but I think those are great examples, great techniques that you talked about is like, yeah, if you're feeling stress is to, hey, put on a comedy video that you really like that's gonna make you last or, or watch some comedy videos on YouTube or whatever, or yeah, call up those friends. There's certain friends that you probably, every person, you know, kind of has, that's like, okay, yeah, this is someone that I can just share stories with that I can, I can reminisce with. And so what's your, what's your take on like, how humor is perceived within the FBI, within the organization? Is it something that is welcome? Is it something that it's trained? Like when you went to your group and was like, hey, we're going to bring in this humor speaker where people are like, yeah, that makes sense. It's going to be fun. Or were they like, why? Like any, any thoughts on how it's perceived by other people from the organization perspective? It was funny when I first brought that up, it kind of was like, hmm, never really had thought about that. But then when you start looking back and you start to see, hey, how do people have the most success? You do see the presenters, they have a little bit of humor. They are kind of interesting. So now when I look back, you know, it's usually I think of it's a mixed bag, but now I do see the value in, in all of this, in, in each sector, whether it's internal or external, I, I do see it. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, what we're, we're noticing is just the you know, when, when what you do is important, then you want to use kind of all of the tools at your, your disposal to accomplish that mission or to achieve that goal or whatever it happens to be. And humor just happens to be one of those things that is really effective with people. Like you said, from a presentation standpoint, I imagine if you're going in and talking about, you know, threat levels or things like that with an organization, mm -hmm. it might be important, but that doesn't make it inherently engaging like it doesn't mean like oh immediately i'm gonna now listen to hours of this it's like no you've got to present it in a way that is uh engaging that uses maybe storytelling or other techniques to get people to to continue to listen and i also forgot to mention you were the highest rated segment in san diego and let me tell you fbi agents are not afraid to speak their mind so they would have told us if, oh my gosh, Drew, what, what were you thinking? So we had so many great responses just to your work and people kind of had that aha moment. Oh yeah, we do use humor in meetings or in when we're working with sources or the private sector in which they're more likely to work with us and trust us because, hey, this guy isn't a robot. He's not what we see on TV. I mean, so many people have watched like Die Hard 3 and it's that old, Hey, who's in charge here? Not anymore. Agent Johnson. Like we don't, that's not how we operate. We are transparent. We want people to know, like you can contact us. You can call us. We're here to help. Which I think is, is, uh, that's a great example. Cause I would imagine, I don't know, like I, I watch some media and I see their portrayal of like hackers where it's mm -hmm. like they immediately sit down and they can hack into anything or whatever. And they just type super fast or like they, or the whole like, you know, cliche of CSI of like zoom in now enhance. And it's like, well, we don't have access to that type of technology. And it doesn't typically, I don't know what like the FBI actually has access to. So I'm curious, are there things that are like, that's totally not how the FBI is. I think that's a great example. You're not showing up on all these different places. Like I'm in charge now and everyone like, hates it and all that kind of stuff. Anything else that comes to mind that you're like, oh, it's not actually like that. Yeah, everyone thinks we have iris scanners and all these special uh, fingerprint scanners. So, I mean, maybe we should keep people on edge, but uh, really it's a lot less of what you see in the movies. And while we do have a lot of, like I have so many just success stories and things that I, you, I just couldn't do if I didn't, if I wasn't an FBI agent. But what people don't realize is for every hour of fun, it takes 10, 11, 12 hours subpoena returns, looking through bank records. But that's also what makes it worthwhile as a career as an FBI agent. I mean, if it was easy, it wouldn't be, it just wouldn't be worth it. Yeah, well, and I think it it's so true in so many things. That's, that's exactly the same thing that's true about humor is that you know, you see, and I think this is what intimidates people because we so often kind of like gloss over the hard work part. 
that it's like, oh, well, you know, Mike is a good FBI agent because he's just naturally fit and like good at these certain things. And it's like, or, well, you also did a lot of prep work to know exactly what you needed for the physical and to also like do the hard work of the, the subpoenas and other things. And, and same thing with humor. People see someone like, you know, Chris Rock or mm-hmm. Ali Wong or whoever go up and do humor and they're like, oh, they're just naturally funny and I could never do that. They don't see the, you know, what, um, there's a great speaker now and named Alan Stein, Jean, uh, Alan Stein Jr. who does a lot of work with athletes. And he's like, you don't see the unseen hours. That's why they're called the unseen hours of all the hard work put into it. So it's good to know that also in this role that, yeah, there's uh, those moments of excitement, but there's also the due diligence needed beforehand, very much like humor as well of that that practice and, and, and working on it. And so- Totally daunting to me, Drew, if you had me go on stage and try to tell jokes. Like, I, I give you so much. I mean, the effort and time it must take. Well, and so this is what I think is so interesting. So now that you say that, okay, now my next goal is to get you to do stand-up comedy. Uh, because it's it's something that is, uh, one, I think one of the hardest forms of public speaking you'll ever do. And so by doing that, all of your other presentations become a little bit easier. But it's also not quite as hard it is work, but it's not necessarily quite as hard as you make me like think that it is because you've already got these great stories like any like storytelling is such a great way to incorporate humor. I love that as an example that you shared of like, yeah, if you're getting ready to go into a meeting for you to share a short story beforehand that sets up kind of the theme of that day or this connecting piece or even that like that great self-deprecating humor at the beginning. If you're like, hey, like so if it's your first meeting with someone, you can be like, Hey, so just to uh, clarify a couple of things, uh, you know, it's, we're not exactly like what you see on TV. It's not going to be X, Y, or Z. And then you might even be like, but this part is true. This one thing about it is that it is true. We all are handsome. We all are attractive <laughs> people, like, like whatever it is, that's going to like ease the tension. And the fact that you use humor almost more so than what the humor is, just the fact that you did it and got people to like laugh a little bit, I, I would imagine goes a long way in building those stronger connections. A hundred percent. I just literally got a text today like, hey, Mike, thanks for livening up that meeting today. So, yeah, you're, you're right. But that's thanks to you, Drew, and just trying to incorporate different aspects to be as productive as possible. And so with the with that work, do you see it as a is humor at all talked about as a skill or sometimes people don't use the exact word of humor, but they talk about, oh, you need to be engaging or tell stories or that kind of stuff. Is that something that is communicated to people as part of how to do the job? Or is it something more left up to kind of the individual's their own kind of personality styles to say, okay, yeah, if it fits in, it does. Or if it, if, if they're not very good, not very humorous themselves, it, it just doesn't happen. I would say it's probably more left up to the individual, but I mean, we do have skills presentation courses. So I think that maybe something we could start to put into the agenda because you know I, I look back and I see all of these examples like like even Quantico I, I don't know if you want to hear another Quantico story yes, but please. so when you first go to Quantico uh you show up in a, in a suit and then I uh you get to fill all this paperwork out there's like tons and tons of paperwork and one of the questions are please state a time you were in a violent encounter. And so I'm like, violent encounter, okay. So I, I wrote something down and a couple months go by, I haven't heard a thing. And then one day I'm in firearms training course. So I had really never fired handguns before. So I'm doing firearms training. And at the end, they're starting to say, uh, Joe Schmo had led three tours in Iraq. Uh, Miss so-and-so, two in Afghanistan, a whole platoon had worn all of these medals and commendations. They go, is there a Mr. Whitaker here? And I'm like, oh my gosh, Uh, yeah, right here. And they go, you put for your violent encounter dorm fight. Was was this a pillow fight? And so it, it was just things like that, just in terms of humor in which it built the camaraderie of the new class. So as a result, I may have gotten a little bit of a ribbing, but it's it's things like that, the use of humor that tied us together as a class. Like we were known as class 1104. And so that was just another bond. Everyone had these stories of humor at play. Well, and that's such a, a funny example of like, yeah, you don't know the context of answering the question. So you put it in terms of, and everyone has their own experiences and for that, yeah. that use of it, right? And, and like, 
just that, that juxtaposition, right? Humor a lot of times is this juxtaposition. So I think this is a fantastic example. And it's, a, it's now a story, right? It's probably something that bonded you together in that moment. And it's now one of the things that you remember, you know, years later from that experience of it coming up. And, you know, as you're talking about, you know, potentially if you were doing, you know, recruiting with new potential agents, like sharing that story makes it more accessible, makes you more like personable as well. Of like, oh, hey, that's a funny, you know, uh, moment. Like you talked about that self-deprecating piece as mm -hmm. inherently by being with the FBI and representing it, the status is going to be a little bit higher. There's going to be an intimidation. The humor immediately, I feel like, oh, wow, like okay, I, I'm, I'm happy to share a little bit more. I like, this is someone that I want to spend, I want to have another meeting with because it was fun this time. A hundred percent. I love doing recruitment. I love talking to new people who want to consider a career. My first five years in the Newark office, I did organized crime. So that's what you think of. Many people think when you go to the tri-state area, organized crime. So I was very fortunate. I mean, just just the stories that you can tell. I mean, Frankie the Flea, who was running numbers. I mean, this is no joke. Frankie the Flea was running numbers out of a nursing home. But remember, he is, he knew some violent people. So there is humor and there is some very just stories that you get to tell that people want to be part of. So I did whether it's organized crime, whether it's uh, Russian organized crime. So you just learn so many different aspects. Well, and, and people want that. And and there's such a there's a um, within humor there's this idea of kind of if this is true, what else is true? And immediately even saying something like Frankie the Flea, one that's memorable. There's the alliteration. I'm curious now, like, is it Frankie the Flea as in like? dog flea or like Frankie the flea isn't like someone who would flee a situation like so then you start to like wonder about the nickname and what are the other like if it is Frankie the flea like if you had an entire organized group that was just based off of like dog things so you've got Frankie the flea and Charlie the collar and like Larry Vinny the leash or whatever right. yeah, Vinny yeah. Aspirin, Ronnie Bagels uh, yeah, I mean, you can't make this, you really can't, make, Jimmy Dirt, I mean, literally, like, learning about dumping dirt in the tri-state area, like, it is a very lucrative business, you know, that we try to find, like, people are always trying to find illegal dumping sites, so wow. you learn just so many things. Yeah, and those, those specifics, I think, so for, like, the, because I think the audience, I'm, like, as, as people are listening, it's like, all right, if I'm not going to be working at the FBI, how does this apply? And I think there's a lot of parallels between this. One is if an organization and people within the FBI, a group like that is using humor, it's probably a valuable tool as part of the, the conversation. And two, that, yeah, everyone, I think every role probably has these levels of specific details that you're just like, yeah, you can't make this stuff up. Mm -hmm. And by being aware of them, maybe even capturing them, what we would suggest is keeping a humor notebook and kind of writing down like, yeah, if there's something that makes you laugh or smile, it goes into a spot, but capturing them, they, it starts to help you build this repository or this database of stories that you're talking about or examples that you can then reference later to better connect with people. A hundred percent. Yes. I mean, all of these things are just great talking points, selling points, getting people to whether do this career, even for a, a, another career when I'm done, you know, when I retire, maybe I'll, maybe I'll join you. Maybe one day you'll get me, Drew. I, I don't know though. That's right. I don't know. I'm going to have to come up with a better recruitment process, what the equivalent of Quantico is. I need a good name for, for the process. It'll be a lot less of a physical one. It might be, it might be related <laughs> to puns. How are you, how, how good are you at puns? Terrible, terrible. <laughs> No, I think Betsy might be better. I think I'll have to get approval from Betsy though. Yeah, oh, I, I love it. And <laughs> so I guess as we as we start to wrap up, as you think about kind of the context, you know, we've shared a number of them. Any other additional context where you see humor is really playing a, a valuable for, role for you, either as an individual within an organization or as a leader kind of within the organization of training people? Like, you know, we certainly have touched upon stress management and as well as communication, anything else that comes to mind in terms of how you've seen humor used either effectively or perhaps the opposite way, ineffectively in the work? Uh, you know, I, I saw one example, which I think is very helpful, emails. In the Bureau, we have a expression, if it wasn't written down, it didn't happen. And so we love emails. And sometimes you get so many emails, it's hard to read. 
And I wish I could say I made this up, but my, my old unit chief, she had actually put one day in an email, I was a circus clown that used to do backflips to see if people actually read their emails. And you know what? Some people are like, what is this? So it was good that people saw it, but there were some people who didn't actually see the email. So that's why it's really important to remember, hey, are we sending too many emails? Is this important or is this not important? So I think that was humor because you want to know, are people really reading? What If I'm spending all this time mm -hmm. doing an email, I want to see if they're reading it. I love that is a great kind of specific example, just almost kind of a like hidden code of like, if you see this, then uh, you respond. And it's similar to, you know, my, um, and I realized this is maybe not a, I think it's an okay comparison. I'm just realizing it sounds a little bit weird of like, oh yeah, that, you know, interesting story from the FBI. That's kind of like my days as a project manager at Procter & Gamble. <laughs> like there's very few overlaps, I think, in some ways between that. But in this case, it is very much an overlap of, I used to add a, a PS at the bottom of my emails, which I, I said st stood for pun script. And it was like, I would include like a quick joke at the end of a status report. And uh, just kind of as like, hey, this is a reward for reading this much longer report. And I remember coming into work one day and having a bunch of replies to one email, one status report email. And I was like, oh no, like, did I mess something up? Is the project like it's currently in red or did I say something offensive or what was it? Mm -hmm. And it was that I had forgotten to write the joke. And so a bunch of people were replying. They're like, hey, where was the, the joke? Are you still doing the jokes? Why didn't yeah. we get a joke at the end of this email? So it was one of those things where it's like, I didn't know for sure, but because of the humor that I was using, and this is an interesting thing, I think valuable point is that when you become known as having like a kind of a humor component to what you do, people are then looking forward to it. So the fact that I was adding humor to these emails, they were more likely to read mm -hmm. and want to read each day. And I would imagine the same thing is true for you. Like you, if you consistently use humor as a, like a way to kick off a meeting, then people start to recognize like, oh, great. When I go to meetings with Mike, then it's going to be humor. So I'm actually looking forward to that one versus maybe some of the other ones on the, the schedule. So it creates kind of, not only does it help in that specific moment, but it helps for future events because people are more willing yeah. to say yes to them. Yeah, definitely. And another one just came to my mind, like just to the use of humor to promote operational security. I remember the one dot guy had left his uh, computer terminal open. So of course, you probably shouldn't do that. So mm -hmm. someone, of course, sends an email to the whole squad saying, surf party, come this weekend, bring your boards. And the guy was pretty upset, but it also struck home, you need to log out of your computer, you know, mm -hmm. you got to exercise good judgment. So humor in which to promote good operational security. <laughs> yeah, that's, that is a great, I need to write that. Yeah, maybe that'll be a next blog post It's humor for operational security. We would do something <laughs> similar of like if, if someone left their computer open, we would change it. There's a one, there's like a My Little Pony um graphic that we would make the desktop background for people that it was like okay yeah if you come back it's gonna be my and it's just it's like yeah it's a playful reminder for something that is important i think the larger kind of context to all of this is that you know humor just because you use humor in a situation doesn't mean that it's not serious doesn't mean that it's not important but just rather that humor can just be a very valuable effective tool for getting kind of better results in the in the work that you are doing so mike i thank you so much for for taking the time to uh, to chat with us uh, if people want to learn more about kind of the, the FBI and they're like, okay, maybe this is a slightly different perception than I thought. Maybe mm -hmm. I have uh, uh, a little interest in at least learning a little bit more. Where should they go? Have them go to fbijobs.gov as well as fbi.gov. And also feel free to reach out to me as well on LinkedIn. I am always trying to be a proponent of people joining the FBI and anything I can do to continue to get more great men and women to join the Bureau. I mean, it really is a career like no other. I mean, funny stories aside, it's impactful every day to know what you do is keeping people safe, making a difference. And I can't emphasize it enough. If we, we need you all and uh, please uh, yeah. reach out to me. And I'm Absolutely. Really well, and, and what I would say is, is um, I think you've done a fantastic job. It's, it's certainly, you know, our, our conversations together and the work that we've done has certainly changed my perception about it. 
uh, if, uh, if I was, you know, if it wasn't, Hey, I'm, I'm going to go and speak and, and train for a living and other things, it would probably be an area like, Oh, this is really fascinating, really curious about it. So certainly, um, uh, take Mike up on that and, and check it out if you are interested in that area. And, and Mike keep sharing the, the humor. I think it does make it, it makes something that seems so, so like abstract or big or like, you know, different it makes it much more accessible and, and love the humor and the, the work that you're bringing to it so thank you so much for joining us for this episode of humor talk